We have saved uh, the last, the best for last, and that is a true statement. A recurring uh, topic at this week's conference has been the telling of the community action story. Specifically, how do we talk to Congress? How do we talk to our communities about community action and community services block grant? We thought it'd be interesting to broaden this discussion. How do we talk about poverty? Our panel this morning focuses on poverty in the press. How does the press report stories of poverty? How does this reporting affect the, what the public thinks about poverty or poor people? How does the press influence what people think about the anti-poverty programs like ours? We, got a, we have a panel of four outstanding journalists that are, that are here to share their views on this important topic. As background for the session, we presented them with three general themes. First, it's generally agreed that poverty is underreported in the mainstream press, especially at the community level. And even when stories are told, they sometimes perpetuate the stereotypes or lack content and context. Second, the journalism profession is responding with some creative initiatives to encourage more and better reporting about poverty. Some of those initiatives support low-income uh, journalists who couldn't otherwise do the work in order to broaden the range of voices that are heard. And finally, local po anti-poverty agencies can play a role in helping shape and tell the stories of poverty in America. Our moderator this morning is Terrence McCoy. He's a reporter for the Washington Post. Terry covers poverty and social issues in urban and rural America. He's received numerous awards, including a 2016 George Polk Award for stories that showed how companies in an obscure industry made millions of dollars from exploitative deals with the poor and disabled. Prior to joining the, the Post in 2014, Terry was a staff writer at the Miami New Times and a reporter at the Houston Press. He also served in the Peace Corps in Cambodia. We're honored to have Terry moderate our session this morning and to have such a distinguished panel of journalists. Terry will share some of his own views on the topic of poverty in the press, and then we'll introduce the other panelists uh, today. Following their remarks, we'll have time for questions from the audience and from the members themselves. I look forward to a lively and, and uh, uh, timely conversation. So please join me as we kick off our panel of Poverty in the Press. Well, everybody, thank you so much for coming. Um, this is a, a really important issue uh, to talk about right now, particularly at this moment when poverty um, and poverty in the press and people who are experiencing poverty, this is a very urgent time. Uh, we, uh, a number of pressures are assailing people who are low income, whether it's gentrification, uh, being pushed out of communities that they've lived in for decades. Um, and we're also um, in a time of an administration that is trying to push forward a lot of initiatives that are rolling back a lot of the social safety net. So this is a really important moment, as you all know, and I'm really excited even to talk to you because you oftentimes are the people who I'm calling uh, to try to see if I can find any sources for, for the, the communities that you're serving. I found that community action agencies are, are some of the best people for me to talk to when I'm working on stories that are far from Washington, trying to find someone who can connect me with, with a great source because you are grassroots, you are serving the communities, you are with the people who oftentimes I'm trying to write about. Um, that said, so this is a really important time and it's incumbent upon us as journalists to be able to get this story right. And, and how do we tell this story with nuance and complexity and, and do justice to the people who are covering? And that's what this really, this, this panel is going to be about. Um, I come to poverty uh, coverage myself, as, as was just said, I was in the Peace Corps um, in Cambodia and lived for a number of years in, in among people who are experiencing extraordinary poverty. And um, those stories, I find covering poverty to be both immensely rewarding and enriching, but also immensely frustrating, too, uh, because of the fact that um, 
when you're writing about people who don't have much, uh, they oftentimes, the thing that they can give you most is time. And I find that to be incredibly rewarding because I can spend as much time really with somebody to really get their story right as they're willing to give me, and oftentimes they're willing to give me a lot. Um, at the same time, writing about poverty can be frustrating because a lot of people don't quite understand the people in those circumstances. And we're living in a society now of widening inequality and of people inhabiting bubbles, and they don't quite understand why it is that somebody can be in the circumstances that I'm writing about. Oftentimes, people understand poverty as, as these two poles. Either somebody is poor because of personal volition, it's uh, because of their own doing, their own sort of actions that resulted in their circumstances, or it's because of circumstances beyond their control. It's these structural sort of barriers that keep them from being able to uh, go beyond their status. I find it to be somewhere in the middle, um, that, that the, the world and poverty is messy and complex, and, and we can't really oftentimes shunt it into these two boxes of why people are poor or not. And oftentimes when I write stories, people don't quite get that, or they get frustrated and say, why don't you write it this way, or why don't you write it that way? And everyone seems to have an opinion about it, which is great. Um, but at the same time, I would say I am, I am bullish right now about writing about poverty. I think it's immensely important, and I think there's immense readership and immense potential to attract readers by telling the stories of people who are experiencing poverty. In 2017, I wrote a year-long series about uh, disability in rural America. And this is something that, believe me, did not usually play well like cocktail parties and be like, oh, I'm writing about disability in rural America. And people were like, really? Why are you writing about that? And, uh, but oftentimes, I would write the story, and uh, I would try to tell it as a seamless narrative, and the readership would be immense. Oftentimes, these stories I wrote about some random person that had no news value beyond the fact of whatever experiences they had in that moment um, would leave the Washington Post website for the entire day of top readership. People were immensely interested in these stories if we tell them the right way, if we tell them with nuance and complexity and, and do, do them justice. And that's why I'm so excited to talk to our panelists today. Um, we have a really strong panel, um, beginning with Michael Clay Carey, is a journalism professor at Samford University in Alabama and author of The News Untold, Community Journalism and the Failure to Confront Poverty in Appalachia. Dr. Carey worked as a reporter and editor in Tennessee for 10 years before entering academia, where his work focuses on culture, cultural studies of media. His award-winning book explores community journalists in rural Appalachia, how they choose to cover local stories of poverty, and how this coverage affects public perceptions. We also have with us Joe Williams, is a senior editor at US News' Healthiest Communities section covering social determinants of public health. His previous assignment for U.S. News is covering the Supreme Court and national politics, including the 2016 presidential election. Williams is also an experienced freelance journalist and since 2014 has been a contributing writer for the Economic Hardship Reporting Project, a nonprofit journalism organization founded by Barbara Eichenreich, author of Nickel and Dimed or Not Getting By in America, a former White House correspondent for Politico and deputy bureau chief for the Boston Globe. Williams was an on-air political analyst for CNN and MSNBC. He's written about race, politics, education, sports, and even food for numerous leading publications. And we also have Fernando Diaz, is the editor and publisher of The Chicago Reporter, a nonprofit newsroom focused on data-driven investigative journalism on issues of race, poverty, and income inequality. Before joining The Reporter in November, Mr. Diaz was the managing editor of Digital at the San Francisco Chronicle. He also has served as a senior editor for Reveal, from the Center for Investigative Reporting and was managing editor of OI, the Chicago Tribune's Spanish language daily. So thank you all for coming. And um, Clay, do you want to start us off? Sure, Terry. Thank you for that introduction. And, and thank you all, all for, for being here today and, and for the work that you do. Uh, you know, one of the things that Terry didn't mention in his introduction that I think is maybe pertinent for you to know about me is that I'm a small town guy. I grew up in Hartsville, Tennessee, a rural, rural community. And, in Tennessee, served by the Mid Cumberland Community Action Agency. Any Mid Cumberland people in the crowd? <laughs> Good deal. <laughs> but in you know, in that small town, I had the opportunity to see the good work that that organization did from the perspective of a community member as well as a journalist. And so, the work that y'all do matters in your communities every day. And I really am grateful that that you are are willing to do that work. Um, most of my primary interests as 
a journalism person and as a, a writer and a researcher, lie in the, in the field of thinking about how local media organizations influence civic life in rural communities. And so my work on the News Untold was, was largely focused on that, on thinking about the, the ways that local newspapers in small towns write about income insecurity and how that in turn shapes the views that the people who read those, those news outlets have of the issue and of their neighbors. I'm also involved in an organization uh, that's working on an effort called Media Seeds, which is uh, working to try to build capacity for journalism and, and community engagement uh, in small towns in Appalachian, Ohio right now. And the common theme that runs through both of those efforts is the idea that local journalism, when it's done well, can build the capacity to have a more inclusive community. We can have more voices in the civic discussion and more diverses in the civic discussion when we make that a priority and when we do our due diligence to make it happen. But unfortunately, we know that a lot of times that isn't what we get. Often, small towns, and this is the, the crux of, of my work on the News Untold, often in small town journalism, there's little to no reporting on economic insecurity. And that's even true of, of communities where poverty is, is a, a huge problem. Uh, so we often see no coverage of these issues. And when we do see coverage, it's often not done very well. It is a, a brief story about unemployment numbers that were released or uh, you know, some a check being handed off to a nonprofit organization. And a lot of times that information kind of divorces uh, economic insecurity from its local context. And it also generally excludes the voices of people who experience economic insecurity firsthand. And so in the book, I really try to, to understand why those stories don't get told. And I would argue that there, there are principally four main reasons why. One of those reasons is that a lot of times there's a lack of resources in news organizations in these communities. Some of you work in communities where there's a newspaper that is a one-person or a two-person operation. One of my first jobs out of college was at a two-person newspaper. And so that places a lot of stress and demand on the journalists. And so as a result of that, in order to get their work done, they find themselves getting into a very standard routine. And a lot of times that routine doesn't involve the kind of deeper questioning that I think is really important to coverage of any social issue, but particularly localized poverty. Uh, that is one important reason, but in, in the reporting that I did for my book, I didn't really find that it was the primary reason. There's also a sense that exists among many small town newspaper reporters and editors that they run the risk of embarrassing or alienating individuals in a community if they write about their economic insecurity. I experienced this again and again. The idea that, well, I don't want to write about, I interviewed a lot of journalists for this work. And again and again I would hear, well, I don't want to I don't want to interview so and such about uh, you know, their poverty situation because I don't want them to feel alienated. I don't want them to feel bad. And so I don't think that really comes from a position of the journalist not believing that people can't tell their own stories. Because people who deal with income insecurity are perfectly capable of articulating their lived experiences in the same way that all of us are. I think it often comes more from a perspective of being concerned about how the community at large will react to the telling of those stories. And there's also a sense that is kind of coupled with that that I experienced in a lot of communities that had been dealing with poverty and, and unemployment and, and these issues over a long term. I often heard journalists tell me that, you know, I don't want to tell this story because it'll depress the community. One of the people who I interviewed was the editor of a, a small town newspaper 
uh, near the Tennessee-Kentucky border. And his, new, his community, at the time I interviewed him, had had the highest unemployment rate in its state for something, for every month, for I believe three straight years. So it was a place where unemployment was constantly a problem. And when this community was featured in regional news, that was always the frame. Here's this town, highest unemployment rate in the state. They can't do anything about it. Here's what they're trying to do. And so the editor of this newspaper told me, you know, that's all people ever hear about us. In this community, when we're in the news, that's all it is. Unemployment, unemployment, and people just get beat down. And so his perspective was, well, I don't want to write about poverty in that way. I want to do something else that lifts us up. But he didn't really know what that was. And so that's an area where I think that community action agencies and other organizations can really help people who work in media find that answer. And then the other principal objection that I found among community journalists and small town newspapers, editors and reporters when they were faced with the issue of why they don't write about poverty, was this idea of journalistic objectivity. A lot of people would say, well, I can't, I don't want to start a conversation about poverty in my community because it's not the journalist's job to make the news, it's the journalist's job to report the news. They were fine with covering poverty if the city council was talking about it, or if the chamber of commerce was talking about it, or if the county commission was talking about it, or if your organizations were talking about it. They were much more hesitant to try to start that conversation themselves because they didn't want to be viewed as straying away from this kind of straight down the middle idea of what objectivity is. And so what are the consequences of all this? Well, y'all see it. I don't have to tell you, but dominant narratives about poverty aren't challenged when we don't cover it in a more rigorous way. Uh, in Appalachia, where most of my work kind of falls, there's a, there's a dominant understanding of, of poverty as a, a cultural component of communities, that it's just ingrained in a place and that there's nothing you can do to change it because it's just a fact of life. And I know that's not true. And those of you who work in the region know that that's not true. But it is a view that a lot of people in the region and outside the region hold of why poverty persists in, in that part of the country. And when we don't present another narrative to challenge it, then it sticks around. And so another side effect of this is that Important voices don't get heard. People don't get to engage in the conversation about their own conditions. We never, not never, we rarely see the people who face income insecurity on a day-to-day -day basis with the opportunity to, to tell their stories. And so what I want to kind of leave you with is, is some ways that we can challenge this. Usually when I talk about my book, I'm talking to an audience of newspaper people or journalism students. And so what I have to try to tell them in a gentle, friendly way is that they need to really start thinking about what they're doing a little harder. Uh, but for this audience, I want to I want to give you some tips that I think can help you as you go back into your community to try to create an environment where news coverage of, of poverty and other social issues that you're dealing with are a little more productive and a little more inclusive. So look for opportunities to, to push your local journalist out of her routines. You know, make the case to them that this is something that deserves more attention than it's getting. And I think you can also argue, and should argue, that news coverage of poverty in a local community can be constructive. Uh, there's, there's an excellent resource out there called uh, the Solutions Journalism Network that I would encourage all of you to, to check out if you have a few minutes. Solutions Journalism, I'm, I'll try not to drone on about it for too long, but it's basically an approach to media that focuses on trying to solve problems in community rather than just saying, here's the problem, look how bad it is, and then moving on to the next problem. Solutions journalism is much more focused on 
trying to fix things that are wrong with a community or trying to suggest options to make things better. Uh, the Solutions Journalism Network has lots of examples of stories like this where journalists have been spurred to take that extra step. And so I would encourage you to check that out. And when you read a story that you'd love to see about your community, send it to the editor of your local newspaper and say, hey, you know, this would play really well here. We should have a conversation about it sometime. Uh, you know, another thing that you can do is you can, you can create newsworthy moments for your local reporter. Uh, if you're in a small town, your local journalist is super busy, and so she's probably stuck in her regular routines of I cover the city council, and I cover the chamber of commerce, and I cover the county commission, and I go to the courthouse. And if you try to butt in on that, she'll give you some attention. If you have a press conference, if you send out a news release, if you do something as simple as send her a statewide report about uh, the availability of low-income housing or, or LIHEAP assistance and say, hey, here's this statewide report. Here's what I would say about it in the local context. That little step can open the door to get that, that story into your local media ecosystem. And the last thing I want to encourage you to think about is trying to help empower people to tell their own stories. I think this is where news organizations have the, the most kind of transformative power. Uh, are there people who you work with in your programs from day to day who have a compelling story that they could tell to the news organization that might challenge the way people view poverty, that might challenge the way people view folks who are on various assistance programs. Can you help that person develop the efficacy and the confidence and maybe give them the platform to tell that story themselves? Uh, I mentioned Mid-Cumberland Community Action Agency, uh, which is the community action agency in the town that I grew up in earlier. One of the things that they started doing recently is they have a blog on their website, and periodically they'll just write about somebody who uh, is a LIHEAP reci recipient. They'll tell their story and they'll talk about the difference that it makes that, that they are, are engaged in this program. That's a simple little thing that that organization does to try to challenge the narrative about, uh, about these services in that, in that community. There's something really transformative, I think, about uh, a community hearing those stories for the first time, but there's also something really empowering about giving an individual the opportunity to tell her story or his story for the first time as well. And so those are just some, some things that I, I'd encourage you to think about. And uh, with that, I'll, I'll stop and I look forward to talking more. <laughs> Thank you. Joe? Hi, good morning, everybody. <laughs> That's kind of a, uh, Clay is kind of a hard act to follow. That's uh, really very impressive. And uh, it's so interesting because I share something with each one of the columnists, or each one of the panelists here. I used to work at Miami. Um, I'm from Tennessee, never worked in Cambodia, but you know, there's time to get there. Uh, so I represent the Economic Hardship Reporting Project here uh, on this panel, and uh, my day job is uh, I'm a senior news editor for US News and World Report, and what I cover is social determinants of public health, which a lot of you are probably familiar with, um, which is, was an odd assignment for me because I walked in uh, the office one morning on a Wednesday in March, almost a year ago, and I had been a Supreme Court reporter, so that morning I walked in expecting to do a story about the latest rulings and so forth. Uh, I walked out that afternoon as a public health reporter, <laughs> which was really kind of interesting and amazing and kind of challenging and had me scratching my head. I was like, well, what just happened? But what happened was, I think, a really exciting turn in my career and something that's given me uh, an opportunity to present the nexus of my uh, moonlight job and my day job because public health and, and uh, income are very much intersected and my work at uh, EHRP is very much related to how uh, income inequality and, and uh, economic pressures are driving down uh, income across the, uh, the, the spectrum but is increasing the number of poor and is also creeping up into the middle class. 
And uh, as I've been a reporter for, for many, many years, probably longer than anybody here on this panel, but the one thing that I noticed is that everybody likes a good story. You know, it can be from anywhere. It can be from uh, Appalachia, it can be from Chicago, it can be from DC, it can be from the suburbs. So I think that's the one thing that I, the, the, the initial overarching theme that I want to talk about for a minute or two. And I've been on both sides because not only have I been a reporter and now am covering poverty, I actually was poor once myself. Uh, it was very briefly, um, not too long ago, uh, I'd lost my job, I ended up uh, getting evicted, I couch surfed for a while, and uh, I finally started doing what I know best, which was keeping a blog and writing. So I'd write every single day about what happened to me that day, about writing the, you know, writing, you know, what the transit bus was like, about what it was like going to a social service agency, and about what it was like trying to, to resurrect my life after falling out of the middle class, basically to the bottom, because my parents grew up poor, they built a life for me and my sisters, we all decided, you know, we all became educated and were in reach of achieving the American dream. And I think I read somewhere where it takes five generations to break the cycle of poverty. We were the fifth generation. But it was so fragile, and it is so fragile, that it takes very, very little for somebody to fall from the middle to the bottom. So that's been the basis for a lot of my work for EHRP, as I've written essays about what it was like to be evicted and why it was such a problem nationally. I wrote about transportation deserts, which a lot of you guys are familiar with, particularly in rural and exurban areas. I wrote about the underbanked and how I was underbanked and what I did to get by to do that. And so I kind of became, uh, I used my, my own personal experience as kind of an avatar to tell other people's stories. And you know, use my own personal experience as an opening and then talk about the broader issue, which I found was really, besides incredibly frightening, <laughs> was really kind of gratifying. And to Clay's point, it gave me an opportunity to tell my own story, but use my story as a voice to tell about this larger problem. So. Uh, in, in talking about that, I kind of wanted to, to warn you that I, I have a tendency to have what I call soapbox moments, where I'll get so really passionate and, and fired up and invested about this thing that I, I just can't help myself, but I have to like nudge aside my journalistic bias and just say how ridiculous this problem is and why we're experiencing it and, and how we can, as, as journalists, write about it and overcome it. Um, the one thing that, that, that I would, would, would uh, start talking about in, in terms of this discussion is that a lot of people, a lot of reporters and a lot of organizations don't like writing about poverty because it's, it's you know, as Clay mentioned, people don't want to drag a community down, they don't want people to feel bad about themselves, but I found that a lot of it is whistling past the graveyard, that we are all walking on this, this thin sheet of ice uh, called the U.S. economy, and if we break through and fall down, who is going to help us up? We might be the person who is, who is embarrassed by what has happened we might be the person that has to ask for help. And so to try to talk about it and discuss it, uh, kind of like the, uh, the Bloody Mary thing in the mirror, if you talk about it and you get yourself thinking about it, it might become real. So that has been my experience in trying to get newspapers and news organizations to really understand that this is an issue. 40% um, of all Americans don't have enough in the bank to weather a $1,000 emergency. And I think the percentage goes higher when, it when you talk about uh, or goes, I think it's 30% don't have enough to weather a $400 emergency. Mm -hmm. And these are people who have jobs. These are people who are going to work day to day, ride the bus next to you. Um, bankruptcy, job loss, a bad illness, any one of those things can cause your neighbor to become poor. College is increasingly becoming out of reach, and we know that college is the ticket to the middle class. Uh, and it's even worse for people of color because uh, the, as the saying goes, if, if, if white America catches the cold, black America catches pneumonia. So it's that much more difficult if you're a person of color to dig your way out of a hole or to, to make it and advance as, as much as the economy has changed. Uh, and all that to say that the face of poverty has changed. And I think that's one opening that you might have when you're talking, about your various, talking to your various news organizations about stories and to bring an issue to the fore. The face of poverty has changed. It no longer looks like the homeless guy with, with, with a card on the corner. It looks like the mom dropping her kids off at school and then making a side trip to the food bank. Uh, as part of my volunteer uh, service, uh, my church had a uh, food pantry where we'd get donated food from uh, Safeway, Giant, you know, local grocery stores. On Tuesdays, the first of the month, the line would be stretched all right around the block. 
and there would be people in white collars, there would be people in, in uniforms, there would be people who you did not expect would have to take advantage of these services. The government shutdown kind of re-emphasized re that point that we had in December, where you had communities helping create uh, public services for military service members and for government employees who had missed a paycheck or two and couldn't figure out how they were going to feed their families. So the face of poverty is, is, is changed. I'm certain every one of you thinking, you know, sitting here right now can think of somebody who might fit that profile that might become a story that you might be able to, to, to pitch to your local newspaper. Um, the other thing is gentrification. Uh, I live in, in D.C. here where it's just been a nightmare. Um, and it's pushed uh, people from the urban center, uh, poverty-stricken people from the urban center, out to the suburbs and even further to the exurbs. So you have a growing poverty crisis in suburban America that's not really being talked about. I live in Montgomery County, one of the richest counties in the nation, not just in Maryland, but one of the richest in the nation that has a problem with poverty in certain areas. There are pockets where people are just destitute. And it always strikes me how in the middle of the richest country in the richest county in the richest uh, uh, state in, you know, one of the richest states in, in, in the nation, that you can have this problem and not have it be alleviated. So pointing out these contrasts are also very good stories for journalists. Um, there haven't really been, I mean, I may be corrected if I'm wrong on this, but uh, I, I don't recall any new major sweeping poverty initiatives since a lot of the organizations that you guys work for came into being. We don't have the war on poverty anymore. A lot of people have considered it a failure. Why is that? Is there examples that, that kind of indicate or illustrate what has gone wrong and what, to Clay's point about solution journalism, what can be fixed? Uh, and the ripple effect is, uh, is touching almost every issue you can think of. Education, there's a poverty component. We're you know, stuffing backpacks for kids who don't have enough to eat. Uh, housing, certainly, we, you know, we ran that up, uh, down a little bit about how rising increases are pushing people out of the city center and more into the suburbs. Um, education, pov uh, education, housing, uh, transportation. One of the stories that I did was best received was about how there are these transportation deserts in suburban America where people who are poor have, are looking for jobs. The jobs are over here in another suburban community or even another city center, but there's no way to get them from there to here unless they have a car. Uh, daycare, I don't know how many moms are in the audience, but I, you know, one of the other stories that I've written that, that, that kind of went viral is the fact that daycare is almost as much as a college tuition, but your daycare provider, the person who you hand over the toddler to in the morning, makes less than, in some cases, a guy working at McDonald's down the street, taking care of one of the most precious resources a family has. Why is that? How does that happen? And, and I recently did a book review um, about uh, a book by um, a Nashville epidemiologist. It's called Dying of Whiteness. It talks about how the, 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 the poverty uh, impact and, and the political will or the political uh, uh, sort of motivation to end poverty programs, to slash them, to, to punish the poor with work requirements for, uh, for medical insurance, or even, you know, in Kansas they had one initiative where you could only withdraw $25 a day out of an ATM machine if you were getting public assistance. A, try finding a, uh, uh, an ATM that will give you $25, and B, try spending that in one day that doesn't require food and, and try to make that stretch out. Um, how these poverty initiatives are literally impacting the health of white America. It's measurable. There, there, there are measures in years lost, uh, years of life lost for people who want to punish the poor because it creates a ripple effect and it damages the wellness of a community. So all of these are really fascinating uh, to me, I think, fascinating stories and angles that I've tried to explore through my stories. Uh, but ultimately, I think there is an appetite for this, and all you have to do is look at the, the most recent bestseller list, because you know, currently one of the bestsellers is made about a woman who uh, worked her way up from uh, being a domestic to graduating college after being in an abusive relationship and having to depend on social services. Uh, Evicted was a bestseller a couple of years ago. Exactly, Evicted was a bestseller a few years ago, and it was talking, tracking evictions in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Right now, one of the stories that I wrote about was the surreal experience of being evicted and how we don't keep national records on how this happens. Uh, another story you all are familiar with, Hillbilly Elegy, rocketed to the top of the charts. It's gonna soon be a major motion picture. Um, 
like Clay said, people want to read about this. I think in part because they're, they're, they're fascinated by how this happens in one of the richest countries in the world, but also because there's an aspect of whistling past the graveyard. I hope this doesn't happen to me. Let me figure out what happened to them so I can avoid that. Um, ultimately, you know, ultimately, I think that, that, that good stories will out, and, and I'll stop rambling here in a minute and say that good stories will out. Journalists want good stories. They usually go against the grain, something unusual or, or striking about a situation. It demonstrates an underreported problem like daycare uh, providers getting low pay and like having not enough transportation to get pe poor people from a job to where they live. Uh, it's relatable and changes the face of poverty. It's no longer the other, you know, that poor guy living in the projects. It's the guy living next door who's having to survive with public assistance. It's the vet, it's the teacher, it's the lawyer who are just getting by and maybe have fallen to the bottom, and that is a very relatable story as well. And it touches everyone and all issues that we face every single day. If you've got examples of that, which I'm sure many of you do, that's another really good sell. Uh, the poor next door, as I call it. So all of that to say that, that it is, the opportunities are out there. We are having more and more organizations, mine included, because I, I find I'm very subversive about <laughs> writing about this in my day job, where I, I went to Nashville to write about how great this one community was, Williamson County, Tennessee how it was rich and affluent and had the best health in a really kind of marginally healthy state. But I kind of used that to talk about gentrification in Nashville and how it's pushing all these people south. And yes, this is a really great community, but the other ones are having pressures on them. So it's, it's, it's creativity, it's something that I'm very passionate about, as you can tell. And I think that as the, the passion that you guys have for, for the work that you do can translate in some of these stories and can help get them told in, in major or even smaller publications. So thank you. Thanks, Joe, that was great. Fernando? Yeah, so thank you very much again. Um, it's always wonderful uh, to spend a Friday morning getting to talk about poverty and getting to talk about how we can continue, uh, ideally, to make headway uh, in the war on poverty. I would, say, I would say we're still waging, but we're losing. Um, you know, in, in, in many ways, there, it's analogous to the foreign wars that we're fighting. It's people just don't realize that we're actually engaged in these struggles. Uh, as uh, uh, Terry mentioned, my name is Fernando Diaz. I'm the editor and publisher of the Chicago Reporter. Uh, we are one of the oldest uh, investigative nonprofits in the country. Uh, we were launched in 1972, uh, grew out of the civil rights movement, uh, specifically to keep pressure um, on uh, Chicago, uh, the elected officials, and the community to ensure that some of the gains that were uh, hard fought would not be lost. Um, the Chicago Reporter, uh, since 1972, has prided itself on being a pioneer in data-driven investigative journalism, so uh, obtaining uh, data sets, uh, trying to quantify uh, inequality in all its forms, um, and being able to make those structural issues that Terry had mentioned real for people, things you kind of assume anecdotally but don't actually really know, uh, that's what we've been doing. Um, I am a first-generation American, uh, the byproduct of two economic refugees. Uh, my father left uh, Spain when he was 17 uh, because his family couldn't afford to feed him anymore. Uh, moved to uh, Canada to work in the mines before actually moving to Washington, D.C. and getting a job at a catering company where he met my mom, uh, who moved from Paraguay, same situation, uh, in search of a better life. Uh, so. I have this very uh, weird perspective, um, I think, on poverty because um, my parents somehow broke it in one, um, and that's incredibly, incredibly rare. Um, but growing up, just hearing about you know, g going to bed and not having any food, um, not having any money, not having any shoes, um, the sort of things that our grandparents told us were very real um, for my folks. Uh, and so I think, I think part of that informed my uh, desire to get into journalism, uh, to be able to tell some of these stories. Um, you know, I wanna talk a little bit about sort of what, what we do and how it's changing. Um, I won't spend a lot of time because I think uh, both Clay and Joe gave you some really good advice um, about how to identify the stories that will get people moved. Um, the problem, I think, with covering poverty, and Terry mentioned this, is that um, it's really hard to get people to engage 
um, you, you don't want to spend your time thinking about sad things, right? There's just way too much noise. You can easily jump into your social media feed and disconnect from reality, and the last thing you want to be um, doing is get brought back to a reality that you really don't want to acknowledge exists. Um, so one of the things that I would say is uh, investigative journalism in many ways is trying to embrace this solutions-oriented mindset. Um, and in many ways, it's because of the failings of the traditional investigative journalism model, which was we go out, we beg the bad guy, and society's better. What's the problem with that? There's always another bad guy, right? And there's not enough journalists uh, to be able to do enough investigative journalism to eradicate these problems forever. Um, and so what we really need to do is talk about sustainable accountability and how do we engage our communities in being that much more informed and educated about some of the root causes of poverty and income inequality. Um, right now, I would say that it's very hard to get the attention of a journalist um, to do any of these stories, period, because, and we face it every day, um, there's this guy in the White House who can tweet and own an entire news cycle for days, um, and it makes it very hard to cut through all of the other issues and put other things in the national discourse. Um, the fact that we're all in our own social media worlds means that we can just sort of like retrench um, into our own space without having to engage in a more common dialogue that can get us to a place where we understand each other and understand what we're dealing with. Um, at, at the Chicago Reporter, we're doing something uh, this year that I think is novel in how we're approaching it, but we've been covering income inequality since, like I said, since 1972. Um, I was on a panel on Monday uh, in Chicago as part of the mayoral race. We're having uh, the largest shift in municipal political power in Chicago in three generations. And I'm on a panel with the editors from the Sun-Times that's been organized by AARP about a survey that they've just done around what the next mayor really needs to think about and what what, what are the biggest problems? So of the three biggest problems, seniors identified as reasons for wanting to leave the city of Chicago, crime, rising property taxes, and can you guess what the third one was? Just shout one guess. High utility bills. I was shocked. I was shocked that of all of the issues that are vexing the city of Chicago, seniors' third most problematic issue is high utility bills, and it goes to what Joe was saying. $400 is the margin between somebody keeping their home, keeping their place, keeping their car, keeping their kid in that school. It's $400. So sad and so precarious, and that's the society that we've created for ourselves. So we're investigating, so we're trying to figure this out. We're investing alternative, investigating alternative energy suppliers in the state of Illinois. 1.7 million Illinois residents get their energy from an alternative energy supplier. How many of you know what those are? So these are folks who resell utility services, be it gas or electric, and theoretically, the promise is that they're gonna give you a lower rate. The reality is that they give you a higher rate. And in many cases, that rate inches very close to $400 a month. That's a great story. Yeah, so, so we're doing it. You can do it too. Um, there's a bill right now. There's a bill right now in the uh, state legislature, SB 651, which would attempt to impose regulations on this industry, which is in 20 states and taking advantage of millions of low-income Americans by hoodwinking them into telling them that they're going to pay less. So I'm gonna give you three numbers and then I, I would love for us to just chat because I've been, you know, I'm stoked for this conversation. The first stat is uh, 725 million. What is that figure? I just learned it today. That's the uh, amount of dollars in CSBGs, right? I'm, I'm studying, guys. <laughs> I've got to catch up to Terry here. Uh, 350 million, I'll just tell you what that number is. 350 million is the entire 
economy of nonprofit news organizations in this country. So folks like, organizations like ours spread around the country, there's about 120 of us. Collectively, we move $350 million. There's almost 2,000 journalists working in nonprofit news right now, and I would count Joe in that, in that group, okay? Third, final stat, $600 million. That is the amount of money paid by Illinois consumers over what they would have paid in actual utility costs to alternative energy suppliers in the last four years. Crazy, right? So we've got all of these issues, and one of the things that, that we're trying to do at the Chicago Reporter is historically the Chicago Reporter has been focused, you have been our audience, elected officials have been our audience, um, uh, movers and shakers, the elite, I'm reading this fascinating history um, of our publication, and from the beginning, the audience has always been the elite, the people who can actually make a difference. In 2019, every one of, one, every one of us can make a difference. And so what we're trying to do is preserve some of that investigative capacity, but really focus on explanatory. Really focus on getting people to understand what's going on. Understand how to get engaged. Understand how to become aware of the legislative process. Um, read before you sign, things that seem so basic, um, but are so important. So you guys, you know, with the weatherization programs that you have, with the access that you have to these folks, are already doing that work. And I think we are at a moment, as Terry mentioned, where we can work together and we can forge a new kind of conversation, but it's gotta be collaborative, and you guys have actually more power than you may know. Because as Clay said, you can tell your own stories, right? And you can identify because you know them better than any of us, and you'll probably get more return investing in identifying and telling those stories yourselves than in trying to get pitch us to do them, right? Because we're gonna end up having to sort that through, and each one of us is gonna have to cut through a newsroom and cut through a news cycle and cut to an editor who's going to end up ultimately deciding to green light or approve of that story. So I'm excited about this conversation, excited about what you guys are doing and have been doing for such a long time, and ideally how we might be able to make a more sizable dent um, in this war on poverty. Great. Well, thanks, Fernando, that was, that was great, that was great. Um, so we're just gonna, I'm gonna ask a question or two here, and then we'll just open it up to, to questions, whatever you may have. Um, and so uh, listening to all, th I'm, I'm blown away by all, what all, all three of you had to say. I learned so much uh, just by listening to you today. And uh, the question I have is the question I think about a lot, is poverty um, is at once so important, but also so big, it's hard to sometimes conceptualize it. It's hard to think about it. It's hard to be like, how do you take this massive issue that affects tens of millions of Americans uh, and tens of millions more Americans who don't even realize it could affect them? Um, and, and how do you storify that? How do you take this massive thing that happens all over the country and how do you make a story out of it that will render you know, a breathless beginning and a can't put it down finish that gets people from point A to point B? Uh, because that is one of the most difficult things oftentimes, is not just even getting people to click, but getting people to read through the entire story. Mm -hmm. and, and also, uh, how, do you, how do you have that story then compete in a news cycle that we're living in right now? I have a, I have a big story that's supposed to drop today. I hope, I hope you all read it. Um, it's uh, a little plug here. It's about, it's about these, um, uh, th this woman who's living under a bridge next to Union Station in a tent and also working a, a full-time job. And, um, and I'm praying that the Mueller report doesn't drop today. Uh, because, because I, I love this story to get read by everybody. Um, but this is the sort of, this is the sort of environment that, that we're living in, um, is that, you know, uh, we, we want to do as good a job as we can, write these stories as well as we can, but there's a lot of competition for eyeballs. So, so the question I have for you all is, how, how do you win that competition? Uh, I'll try to answer just, it's very hard. Um, but I think if we are not challenging the conventions that we use to tell story or to tell stories, 
then, then, we're not, then we're not really going to make an impact. And one of the things that we're trying to do very deliberately is shift our focus in audience. I think as a, as a journalist, I'm always wondering, who's the audience for this story? You know, who is going to read this story? And if they read this story, then what are they going to do with it? Right? And there's sort of like four outcomes that can come from that. They can be uh, outraged, happy, sad, engaged, motivated to action, uh, or bored to death. Um, they can share it. Uh, they can support our uh, organization as we're a nonprofit, like many of you guys. We, we subsist on uh, foundations and donations. Um, or they can actually, uh, you know, do something with that story. But very often, our stories are not focused on the actual person, right? The framing is about poor people as victims. And I think that's one of the biggest problems. Yeah, I think so. And so yeah. because automatically they're a victim, they're powerless. Um, when I was at uh, the uh, Spanish language newspaper, Oi, um, I'd been reading it for years because I'd been in college in Chicago, and I just noticed every single day there were photos of protests. Protesting for, uh, uh, you know, increasing the minimum wage, protesting for housing, you know, and it was a very effective way that the nonprofits engaged in these social struggles had developed very good relationships with the, with the press and were getting their stories on the front page. But what did that mean? It meant that we were portraying an image of this community as perpetually protesting and never actually winning. So we were subconsciously saying that these are ineffective agitators on these social issues that are intractable because we're just, it's every single day. So part of what we're trying to do, and I think where you guys are actually in a very uh, uh, optimal position, is to really empower people who are poor. And I think when you're talking about some of the stories or some of the books on the New York Times bestseller list, right, some of them are because it's a, it's a hero's journey. It's somebody who overcame, you know, almost insurmountable odds, right? And so being able to empower people and make them aware um, is incredibly powerful. And ultimately, it, as a journalist, I think it's a, it's a much more effective means of orienting the story because your audience is of one, right? Instead of thinking that you've got to capture everyone, you're really talking to somebody who's directly affected by the issue that you're covering. It's harder because how do you get to that person? How do you get that story to that person? How do you cut through the news cycle to make sure that that story gets out there? Um, but ultimately, it's a different frame of mind, and I think that's, what, that's one of the areas that we're excited about because now it means we have to think less about mm. sort of uh, depending on the forces that be to change things and actually empower somebody to change their own situation in as much as they might possibly be able to. I have one more follow-up question for that. So uh, something that I think about a lot when I do this work is that the best way to be able to tell a story is to be able to focus on one person's narrative. That's the reason why those, those books you know, do well is you, there's one person's story of whether they're gonna succeed or fail. There's tension in that, people wanna to get to the finish of that story. But there's conflict in writing about poverty in the fact that if you just tell one person's story, one person's story does not encapsulate an entire issue, one person's story does not encapsulate an entire segment of, of, of the population. So there's that tension between being able to tell a riveting tale of one person's struggle while also being able to en encapsulate uh, the broader issue, and it's something that I think a lot of I struggle with. You know, writing stories of poverty. Is how do you how do you strike that balance? Yeah, I think one way, and then I'd love to hear what the other panelists say. I think one way is to invert the thinking that we have in journalism around the sidebar, you know, or the news you can use element. Like sometimes we discard that because there's no space or because there's no interest. But really, and you guys are key because you are the experts there, right? So being able to provide information that is resources, that is organizations and agencies that can help folks who are facing similar issues, I think is one way to do that. Well, I also think that, that uh, my framework in, in going to writing about these stories is why does this matter? Mm -hmm. Why should my reader care about this? And in, uh, certainly in the, the, the story that I wrote about college professors, adjuncts, having to go to food banks, I mean, to me that was just, Personally, it was infuriating, but secondly, it was, okay, this is one reason why your kid's college education, you know, why you should be outraged by why it costs so much to go to college, because colleges tend to employ adjuncts, they pay them very low money, 
and yet they're still charging you or whoever might want to matriculate to this university, an astro Harvard, one of the most wealthiest, one of the wealthiest endowed universities in the world, their service workers went on strike because they were getting sub-minimum wage and they couldn't live in a, an expensive city like Cambridge. That's a story that captures any parent of a teenager, mm -hmm. right, and any person who has ever put on a uniform with a name tag on it to work a job of this sort. Um, from my own personal experience, the stories that I had that, that went most viral, the essays that I wrote about were when I worked at a uh, sporting goods store, and I, I used that, my own personal story, to talk about wage theft, right, and how that's a thing. I used that to talk about uh, spatial economic inequality, which is a fancy way of saying the jobs are over here and you live over there, and I used it to talk about uh, just what it's like for the person who walks into a Starbucks, right? What that person behind the counter is going through, right? So that kind of made a tangent between the reader and an everyday experience that the reader must, you know, has to go through, either buying a pair of sneakers, buying a latte, uh, riding the bus next to somebody who has to get off way on the other end, and what it was like to work in a job that you thought you left behind when you were 16. Right? And now we have a growing number of older workers who are, who are, who are getting these kinds of jobs, especially in rural and, and, and exurban communities. So there are ways to like broaden the lens a little bit, and it requires some work and, and a little bit of, I call it trickery, but you, know, you kind of slip the, the vitamins in, or you know, I think it's like how we have noodle pasta, or pasta made out of uh, like, uh, yeah, yeah you know, exactly. You load it with spaghetti sauce, but you're actually getting the kid to eat his vegetables. Yeah. I mean, for me, that's my subversive philosophy, but it's not for everyone. And I think to Fernando's point, uh, data journalism is very important because it does offer a, a concrete way of making things real that you kind of conceptualize and you sort of know. Um, and uh, to Clay's perspective, you have a lot of overworked journalists who themselves are earning $9 an hour and having to juggle five or six stories a day sometimes. So it's, it's a big problem. Creative solutions, as, as I'm sure Terry, I mean, I can't wait to read your story about, about the woman living under the bridge. I mean, those sorts of things get attention. You have to kind of fight through it. You have to do a little trickery and put the vegetables under the spaghetti sauce, but it can work. Yeah. I think we get really, it's really easy to get from a journalist's perspective and from a reader's perspective, too to get infatuated by that moment when the pebble goes in the water and to not think about the ripples that come out of it. And I think that's where, where y'all as resources in your community can be really valuable to, to the journalists who are, are, are working in your communities to help them see how these, these individual moments and these, these little microcosms of community life have impact in a broader way. Mm -hmm. Well, thank, um, so I'm going to open it up to uh, questions. If anyone has something they'd like to ask, please, please have it. Okay, we got one. Where am I heading? Right there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I've been working in anti-poverty programs for just about 50 years. And uh, one of the things that has not changed much in that time is the stigma that is placed on people of low income. And part of our burden is because of a lot of the narrative, people of low income feel like they don't deserve uh, to have some help. So what do you think the role of the press is in addressing that stigma? Um, I would just say, uh you know, when I, when I write stories, um, and even when I write stories about people who are experiencing extraordinary poverty, uh, the most important thing that I think about is how do you allow someone to always maintain their dignity? Mm -hmm. and, and writing about somebody who, despite the circumstances that they're living in, um, you know, has, uh, their dignity is, is intact. Um, and that then incurs empathy in the readership, but doesn't incur judgment. Um, and when, you, when you're able to tell somebody as a fully textualized, fully formed human, uh, not, just, not just a vehicle to discuss poverty, but they're a real person and this is their life, then I have found that readers um, have extraordinary empathy for people like that. Um, and sometimes I elevate somebody and I write about them and I, I will get um, you know, even as much as 100 emails from, from readers saying, how can I help this person? What can I do? And they're not saying, oh, this person just deserves it. 
Um, and sometimes people who I write about, especially when I'm writing, uh, this changes regionally, but especially when I'm writing in Appalachia, people have extraordinary fear of being perceived to be um, you know, a bottom dweller or somebody just mooching off the system. Um, but if you, if you tell them those stories with, with decency and integrity, uh, I find that oftentimes the stigma is alleviated as opposed to perpetuating it. In Appalachia, there's a couple of generations of, of trends and journalistic approaches to that region that have contributed to that, mm -hmm. to that phenomenon. You know, what you're describing is, is one of the big reasons that I, I think a lot of journalists are hesitant to reach out to somebody who experiences income insecurity and ask them to tell their story. And when a journalist is complicit in that, when the journalist says, well, I don't want to, I don't want to put them on the spot, I don't want to, I don't want to run the risk of their neighbors finding out, then it, it perpetuates this idea that there's something inherently wrong with being in a, a, a position of short-term or medium-term or long-term in uh, income insecurity. Well, one of the things that I found was, was one of the stories that I wrote recently that went most viral was when we went to Chicago to write about the opioid crisis and how there's been a lot of discussion about opioids in the hinterlands, but not a lot about urban, mm -hmm. you know, heroin use. And I found uh, a subject through the uh, assistance of a local um, nonprofit, local drug uh, rehab nonprofit, the Haymarket Center, and they connect me with him. And he had a very, very compelling story. I mean, he told very, he spoke very eloquently about a situation was very open. Uh, but one of the things that I thought made the story was the fact that I was so <laughs> infuriated by this, and another soapbox moment, I was so infuriated by this that I decided to expand the lens and write about how did things get this way in Chicago. And one of the things that I found out was that uh, the neighborhoods that were burned and looted and razed in the 68 protest had never, had not not been rebuilt. I mean, since 1968, there were whole swaths of the community that were blank, kind of uh, garbage-strewn lots with nothing in them. And so I felt like it was my duty to take the time to write about how things got this way. And that got probably one of the strongest reactions of any story that I wrote about the fact that there was so much history behind how this thing got to be there. And it's the same way in sort of the Appalachian uh, opioid crisis is where people write about well, how did it get this way? Why is it this way? And people want to be educated and informed, and when they're like that, the stigma falls away a bit, I think. Not completely, but at least somewhat, so we can get the conversation started about what to do next. Yeah, I'll just add, it, it's very hard, and I think it takes somebody with Terry's uh, skill, Joe's experience, both professionally and lived, and you know, the same with Clay, to do that, because you have to get access you have to make time, you have to develop trust. And then ultimately, I think as storytellers, we need to evaluate, can this person's story, like does it really meet that criteria? Can it really, can it, can it really move the conversation? Like will people really identify or empathize with this person? And on some level, just to be perfectly frank, like that's a mechanical calculation that we make. Right, because we don't have all the time in the world and we can't tell every story, so we've gotta be very, very deliberate about which people and which stories and which storylines we choose. Um, so that's where I would say again, you guys have a sense, everybody doesn't need to feel comfortable um, in order to be able to put more faces on these issues, but there are certainly some people, like the gentleman that you found, who will be who will be more comfortable or who, will, who might be more open. And I think it's a matter of sort of like developing that level of trust, both that you have, but then ultimately potentially with a journalist to see if that bridge can be made. Hi, um, I don't think we know how to talk to the public. I don't think we're very good at communicating on the progressive side of the equation. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that um, like, you know, the conservatives, they'll use uh, the worst, anti you know, a, 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 the Peacekeeper missile, remember that? The MX missile was a violation of every, you know, a, uh, ABM treaty ever signed, and we used to call it the, the Peacekeeper. The, the Blue Skies Initiative, which was a, a polluting uh, uh, legislative proposal, and we, we called it the Clear Skies Initiative. Mm -hmm. And on, on, you know, that's what the Republicans do. They, they, they take complicated uh, issues and they, they 
they melt it down to very simple stuff, mm -hmm. and then they speak to people on their level. We, 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 we get accused of sounding like elites. I think we sound more self-righteous. Mm -hmm. and, and like so when you say, when we say equality, I think what somebody here, what the average person hears is, oh, I get it. You want to take my money and give it to those people over there. Right. And uh, so I think equality is a bad word. I think we should use the word fairness. Mm -hmm. you know, fairness is something everybody gets. It still means you know, everybody's got opportunity, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so I think that we need to be careful about the language we use mm -hmm. and try to speak to people at, at, the, at the right level. Mm -hmm. You know, when, when Obama proposed a, um, a covering 40 million people uh, with health insurance, we called it the public option. We might as well have called it the government boondoggle. Mm -hmm. If the Republicans had proposed it, and they really had actually, a lot of the provisions of Obamacare came out of Republican proposals, they'd have called it the health care opportunity fund or a healthy America, you know, the kind of language that, that nobody can really argue with. And, mm -hmm. and so I think our side needs to do a better job. Frank Luntz spoke, if you remember, at the Club 199 thing a few years ago. He's the master at using those kind of, kind of words. Opportunity is a great word. We don't use it enough. Um, so I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about, about that. Yeah, I'll try to be very brief on that. I mean, you'll never need to convince me that words matter. Um, one of the things to think about, and I think, uh, I don't know the headline on Terry's story, um, but um, we are moving away in journalism from the sort of uh, more poetic headlines or headlines constrained by physical space that we used to have into like every headline starts with how, mm -hmm. or this is why, right? And there's a reason for that, it's because that's how people search, right? And so, you know, branding is an issue, but also making information accessible and findable. To your point about, like, how do we talk to people? It's also how do we prepare this information? How do we make this knowledge accessible in ways that will get people to find it? And we struggle with that in journalism because we want a beautiful headline, a beautiful title. We want poetry, we want the whole story in eight words. And the problem is that that's not how people look for things, right? Well, so- In my shop, it's called SEO. Yes, it's mm -hmm. called SEO. Search engine optimization. Give me, that, give me a headline that's gonna pop up when somebody goes to Google. Give me a headline that's gonna catch eyeballs on social media. And that isn't always conducive to, uh, you know, the Fairness in Health Act or right. to, uh, you know, poverty, you know, poverty alleviation you know, kind of things. And yeah, you're absolutely right, language does matter. Mm -hmm. And the way poverty is discussed in this country, I think, has perpetuated the stigma, number one, and number two, has allowed opponents who believe that, that poor people are moochers, or they're unlucky, or they're not godful, you know, it's allowed that narrative to seep in and take hold, and reversing it is going to be very, very difficult and quite challenging. Mm -hmm. Can I, um, so when you said that, you know, we're not very, you know, we're, we're working to try to talk to the public. Uh, I think a major thing that, that you all can do is, um, that I would love, is, you know, give great tips. Um, you know, if there's like an amazing story that you find or see on your desk that comes by, you find someone that's like, wow, this person really bucks the trend, or this person, you know, there's something extraordinary in this person's story, um, I would really recommend just picking up the phone and, and calling a journalist. Like, I'm always all ears for a great story. And it would save me the time of having to call you to see if you have any. Um, it, it, and just, it, you know, one time I got a tip that was, uh, uh, that went on the front page, and it was a great, it was a, it was a big story about this, this guy who graduated from Harvard Law School with Chief Just, Justice John Roberts, and now he's homeless living on the streets of Washington, D.C. And I was like, wow, that's a, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a great story. And that came from a tip. Uh, so just being able to get those types of stories out um, you know, can really come from, from folks like you a lot of times. Uh, you're the people working in those communities and being able to get that sort of, you know, being in touch with journalists can really help us too. Gentlemen, to your right. Good morning, Patrick Anderson, uh, the Chief Executive Officer for the Rural Alaska Community Action Program. Thank you for probably what I would uh, consider the best panel that I've sat through at this conference. Um, this is for the two journalists, uh, Mr. Diaz in particular, but Mr. Williams as a follow-up. Um, in, in 1998, they, re 
the Centers for Disease Control released the results of the Adverse Childhood Experience Study. I, I did a quick search of the Chicago Reporter, could only find one reference to it. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet, um, Danny Davis, the seventh uh, district congressman for Illinois, and Senator Dick Durbin, uh, both co-sponsored a bill called the Trauma-Informed Care for Children and Families Act. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't find any coverage of that. And yet, Mr. Williams, you talked about the opioid crisis. The Adverse Childhood Experience Study sh demonstrated that people who have six of the 10 adverse experiences as children were 6,200% more likely to be IV drug users than those who had zero. Uh, and, and yet I find very little discussion about the linkage uh, between poverty and growing up with these toxic stresses. Uh, one, of, one of the uh, reported outcomes of toxic stress is that your brain shuts down as a child and you're unable to learn at the same rate. Mm -hmm. uh, those of us who operate Head Start see that poverty every day, and yet I uh, saw no reporting in the Chicago Reporter on it. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you know, Mr. Williams, I'm sorry I didn't do a search for a U.S. News, but it seems to me that the relationships um, between adverse experiences and the like is huge in poverty, and poverty apparently is a five, uh, constitutes or leads to a $500 billion loss to the U.S. economy because of the lost productivity of these folk. But, uh, a any discussion on why issues like this aren't covered, root causes of potential yeah, poverty? Absolutely. I would say that you are seizing on um, or identifying sort of like the, Ach the Achilles heel, if you will, of investigative shops such as mine. Um, I think at the peak, the Chicago Reporter had seven people on staff. Uh, today, with their six, including me. Um, so, you know, and this is not to excuse it, in uh, 1998, uh, I had just graduated high school, um, so uh, I wasn't ready to write that story. Um, <laughs> we, we can't cover everything, and that's going to sound like an excuse, because it is. Um, we just have to pick our spots, and, and, and that's also why I started at the Chicago Reporter in November. Um, I'm coming at it from a very different perspective, informed by years in multiple investigative news organizations that knows that the traditional way of doing investigative journalism is highly inefficient. Um, it's like loading a sniper rifle and shooting from 3,000 yards. And if you get the target, you got the target. But you don't always get the target and then Trump tweets, and nobody reads your story. And now you just spent eight months doing a, an investigation, and, and what was the impact? Um, what we're trying to do now is to identify news stories, to identify issues, to identify reports that, frankly, the public is not going to read that CDC report, and identifies ways in which we can make that more relevant along the lines of the issues that we cover so that we don't have such gaping gaps in our in our coverage. Um, because if you do look at the Chicago Reporter, four decades of awards, four decades of impact. Uh, we had a, a $480 million settlement um, against Countrywide Financial for uh, basically redlining. Um, but we didn't do that story. And we're not doing enough stories about children. Um, so the question then becomes, how do we resource that? If, we, if we're going to do that story, what story are we not doing? And the reason why I'm saying, it's an excuse is because, unfortunately, we're, we're never going to be able to cover all of the issues. Um, we are the only news organization in Illinois covering alternative energy suppliers for the public. The only other person in the state, and I know Joe's taking notes now, and I will help you do it. Um, the only other person covering the utilities is the utilities writer at Cranes Chicago, and his audience are the utilities, right? So that's, that's basically two reporters in the entire state covering you know, what amounted to you know, $600 million in overages in four years. Um, so uh, you know, I would love to be able um, to cover uh, more. 
and to be able to have a more um, expansive output. Um, but right now, we are small. We've always been small. We've had to pick our shots. Well, and uh, what Fernando is identifying is a very real thing in the news industry. Uh, as the news industry has contracted, uh, thank you, Craigslist, uh, as it has gotten smaller and lost revenue, resources are getting really, really scarce. And we do have to pick our spots. Uh, and beyond that, there are all kinds of bloggers and, and people writing news sheets here and there that kind of nip at our heels as well and try to keep us honest and, and try to do the stories that we aren't doing. And that forces us to pay attention to them too, particularly if the story gets a ton of hits. That being said, I mean, I'm scribbling notes because I think for me that's a terrific story and I think I can get that story. But look, we haven't done it yet because that hasn't been what we do. We just went from a political shop to a shop covering public health with, you know, I hesitate to say their name out loud, but we have gotten a major corporate sponsor who has dumped a ton of money on us and we're doing now public health stuff. But this is very clearly a public health story and it's, I mean, one of the things I like, love so much about this beat is I can go anywhere and there will be stories everywhere. And I can't get to all of them like Fernando says because I do have certain obligations. I mean, right now we're finishing up the, the thing that's gonna drive a lot of ad revenue, which is ranking healthiest communities by metrics, by like data-driven stuff. Do I think that's a really great use of journalistic resources? Perhaps. Would I rather do a story about uh, the CDC and ACE, which is something that I just became hip to not too long ago, and I think, it's, I think it's fascinating. And it speaks very explicitly to how these cycles of properties continue, especially my man in Chicago, Daniel, who I interviewed as you know, a heroin addict. He, had like, he scored like a 15 on a 10 question matrix about you know, adverse childhood experiences. And it, it all factors in, it all makes sense. And if you look at the big picture, it's, it's absolutely a terrific story. Gentlemen, based on the amount of time for this session, I think we have time for one more question, if I calculate correctly. It's over here. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, Jim Schuyler with Virginia Community Action. Um, first, Terry, I just want to assure you the Monica Diaz story is up uh, on the Post website, oh, <laughs> and there is no banner headline that says breaking news. Oh. So you've got it at least for a couple more hours. Okay. Um, sure. The second is a tip for your Virginia pages. Uh, Hunger is an issue, but hunger seems to be a media issue only around Thanksgiving and Christmas. With all due respect, and I don't have the data to back it up, I believe anecdotally more poor people eat better at Thanksgiving and Christmas because more people care about them. Mm -hmm. So we don't need your stories around that. Mm -hmm. We're now going around the state with town halls in Virginia to alleviate hunger year round led by our Commissioner of Social Services and Governor Northam's administration. It would help us now, and community action has been a part of this all around the state. It would help us now to focus on a strategy to, to look to alleviate hunger. So I would encourage the Virginia folks, our good friends, that, that they you know, begin to look at that kind of story. Summer is the time when children have the greatest problem, because if they're generally eligible for food in school, they're out of school. Those programs, I think around the country, are, are not using all of the allocated federal dollars. We could really use some help to encourage more agencies, more people to be involved in summer feeding programs. So that's, that's one. And number two is, the point you made all the way at the beginning, Terry, and I was stunned by it because I believe in it, but I thought it only was me. In-depth stories work. Mm -hmm. Eli Saslow is one of the most brilliant people who has written on poverty for your newspaper, and he has been in touch with us over the years. If you're telling me now that people have a greater attention span than 15 seconds, and that they're actually reading it Let's really begin to focus on what kind of in-depth stories do we have that we can pitch to people because we do have the Washington Post Sunday Magazine, we do have the New York Times Sunday Magazine, we don't have a lot of that in media elsewhere. So those are, those are sort of my two, 
two encouragements uh, for you. Thank you. I think this has really been a brilliant panel. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Well, from, from, from your lips to Allah's ear, I mean, basically, uh, we, two of the, when, you, when you were talking about that, two stories immediately brought to mind that I've done. And one, it goes back to the adjuncts, right? The adjunct college professors who are experiencing uh, low income and they went on strike and they're patronizing food banks. You know, these are the people who teach your children, are, are patronizing food banks to keep kith and kin together, right? The second thing is the government shutdown. That was, a, I, I don't know if, if boon is the accurate description to, to, to use, but I heard during the government shutdown more stories about poverty and inequality because it affected people who looked like you. It looked like your neighbor. It was the Coast Guard guy. It was the Army guy. It was the clerk at the DMV. Those are the stories that get traction and that really make people feel, in addition to, to in-depth stories like the one that Terry is doing. P people like to understand that, that these sorts of things are going on, and if they can relate it to their lives, it really makes a huge difference. Um, I would suggest calling your friend at the Post and, and, and getting him, you know, putting a bug in his ear, or coming up with some kind of a media strategy, maybe with some PR people, Okay, how do we talk about this? Schools about you know schools ending. My church does backpack stuffings, you know, for the same thing. You know, same reason. Only on the weekends, right? They'll they'll put you know ramen noodles, an apple, a banana, a peanut butter sandwich, and a backpack for a kid to go home for the weekend because they know that kid's not going to be in school. He's going to be hungry. I mean, this is this is the sort of thing that gets me really engaged, and I think would get other reporters engaged if you have a way to present it and make it relatable, or even talk about you know, how during the, the government shutdown, food, uh, food pantries were stressed to the point where they ran out because these aren't people that they normally see, but just one, one missed paycheck, one month of not working, drove food, uh, food bank patronages through the roof and caused a strain, and there were some poor people who didn't get services and who didn't get meals because it put downward pressure on the system. Those are stories that I think, especially if they're data-driven or if you have some kind of a metric that you can pitch to a paper, actual facts, along with a face or along with somebody who can tell the story that can demonstrate it or illustrate it. Uh, the other thing, I was at a conference in New Orleans, homeless dormitories in college. <laughs> homeless dormitories in college. There are people who, who students who don't have homes. Students who, they have college-run food banks for students. You know, to me, in, 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 in the United States of America, where college is unaffordable, it's shameful. It's mm -hmm. just, it's just, okay, I'm climbing down off the soapbox <laughs> and going back to the real world. But basically, if you have some, some reporters that you have contact with, data makes a difference, uh, public face or, or, or somebody who can represent the problem to you makes a difference, and framing it in a way that can relate to a general reader and not just the elites who focus on poverty. I will just say too, and this may sound like an excuse and I promise it's not, uh, four jobs ago, um, I was on a, a, a blog network that the Tribune launched in order to, to create a larger local audience. I recruited 42 bloggers. Um, we had 300 uh, by the end of the first year. Um, I would agree with you, Eli Saslo is brilliant but I can count the number of stories he's done in the last five years on this hand, and I might have a finger or two left over, right? You guys, there's 400, I think, people in attendance here. That's 400 Twitter accounts, 400 YouTube channels, 400 blogs, 400 Facebook pages. Um, I follow, just like Terry, we're always looking for people. Like, I just found out about this fascinating aspect of the Illinois legislature where there's a Facebook group of people who mobilize to submit witness slips in opposition or support of legislation, and that actually gets tabulated during committee. It's a tiny group, 2,000 people in this Facebook group, but that's viral for witness slips on legislation most people don't even know exists, right? The other thing I would say is there's a lot of out-of-work journalists, a lot of people who are leaving the field right now and have tremendous skill in telling these stories. If there's any part of your budget that can be shaved out for marketing or for outreach, and you can hire some folks to tell your stories, um, I follow Invisible People on Twitter, which is all about um, homelessness. 
Um, that's how I engage with invisible people, is I follow on Twitter and I reshare their stuff. And I, and I feel like, going back to those outcomes that I was identifying earlier, I'm not making a dent in homelessness, but I'm helping get their word out, right? And so maintaining presence on social media means that you can help fill those gaps, because the last thing you want is for them not to cover you on Thanksgiving and Christmas, right? Um, what you want is more sustained, but you can actually drive a lot of that yourself. And so I would just say, you know, if you take all of the energy that you're investing in trying to get you know, the, the post to, to pick up this story, think about 20%, 30% of that energy in maintaining a presence around this issue. Now you're driving the conversation. You're bringing those people together. Yeah, especially in the advent of social media, there's more than one way to skin a journalist, basically, mm -hmm. because you can get your word out uh, on Twitter and in Facebook pages and, and in groups that, mm -hmm. that might be specialized, and they can in turn amplify right. the message which will catch the attention of a publication such as US News or the Washington Post. I will thank you all for, for coming. Yeah. It's been a great, and thank you so much for, for listening.